When I was growing up in what is now today the city of Toronto, I did not live, we did not live very far from a place called Edwards Gardens. And Edwards Gardens was a showcase for the Parks Department of uh, the then city of North York. Nestled along the banks of the lazy Wilkett Creek, it was a beautiful botanical garden, a peaceful place of colorful flower beds and weeping willows and waterfalls and fountains. It was just beautiful, a refreshing place. And from time to time, especially in the summer months, my family would pile into the car after dinner and we would take the short drive down over to Edwards Gardens where we would stroll about among the flower beds for a while. And after a long, hard, hot summer's day, it was just the perfect place to be refreshed and to be renewed and to feel the cool breezes and smell the sweet scents of the blossoms. So I'll tell you something, Edwards Gardens in my heart represents memories of, of belonging, of family being together, of being at peace with one another. And I can tell you absolutely that there is nothing like walking around in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And apparently God understands that feeling. For we discover God doing exactly that at the beginning of our reading this morning from the book of Genesis. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breezes. And what a wonderful and very human picture of God there, isn't it? I mean, you can just see God. Imagine God, after a long, hard day's work, running the whole universe, having the need to just relax and unwind at such, in such a refreshing place. And, and the story almost seems to suggest that maybe, maybe that's why the garden's there, to provide God with that needed place of rest and retreat. You can certainly read this passage in the book of Genesis like that. Because it doesn't actually say why God planted that garden, but it might imply that it was indeed for God's own rest and enjoyment. And of course, God also had to create and appoint a gardener to tend and make that garden beautiful. Just like the city of Toronto hires gardens gardeners to make Edwards Gardens beautiful. And well, you know how it is. When you hire workers to do that, when you hire workers to make a place like that so beautiful, you also have to make sure that those workers have everything that they need. And this gardener that God creates certainly has needs. First of all, he's lonely, really lonely. And so God goes to work, trying to create a companion for the gardener. God creates all sorts of animals that are brought to the man, and the man is happy to name them all. But alas, there is not one found among them who can be the kind of companion that the gardener needs, the kind of companion that can be his equal. And we all know, we've all heard the story of how the best kind of companion was found. And yes, she was not created as a lesser being, but rather as a being taken from the side of the man to be his equal so that they could work together to be the best that they could be together. And so apparently God had it all worked out. God had a, a wonderful gardening team who could be glad in their work because they were together. And when God was tired after a long day of running the whole universe, God could just drop by and shoot the evening breezes with the gardener as they walked and talked together of the baconias and the hostas and how they were doing. 
and all was well. And everyone could be at peace and at rest with one another. And this is the description of just how great everything was between them all that comes at the end of that story. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now, I realize that some people might have some problems with how I have told this story. Indeed, with how the book of Genesis tells this story, just because of the way that it portrays God. This story imagines God strolling around in the garden in the evening breezes. It's just a little bit too anthropomorphic for the tastes of some. God is described in a form that is just too human. Now, of course, this whole description of God doesn't have to mean that God was literally strolling around in the garden, feeling the breezes on his cheeks. It is just that in ancient times, people did not have any other way of imagining God, a God that they could relate to, without resorting to imagining and describing God in very human terms. This was kind of the only way they could manage to talk about God. But that doesn't mean that that is what God is. What we have in the story is a narrative that these people created to help them relate to what they had experienced of God. It may not be literally true that God strolls around the garden, but, but, it's actually a very true description of the kind of relationship God wants to have with humans like us. And that brings us back to that description of how things were supposed to be between the man and the woman and the Lord God. And the man and his wife were both naked and we're not ashamed. That tells me something important. It tells me that it was never God's intention that shame should disrupt our relationships with one another or with our God. Now let's pause just a moment here to make sure that we all know what we are talking about when we talk about shame. Shame is something we've all felt, I'm sure, at some point in our lives. But is it something we truly understand? So let's start by defining the difference between guilt and shame. Because I think that's one we often really muddle up. You see, when you do something wrong, either intentionally or unintentionally, you might feel guilt especially if you have hurt someone else in what you have done. And this kind of guilt it can be a very helpful impulse, an impulse that comes to us from God because it's an impulse that can push us where we can to make things right with those we have hurt. So guilt, as long as it's properly dealt with, as, as long as it's not carried and not allowed to fester, has a very useful place. And even better, it's ultimately something God can lift from us so that we do not need to live in it. But shame, shame is different. If guilt is feeling bad for something you have done, shame is feeling bad for who you are or for things about you that are beyond your control. Shame is also something we often use to manipulate others to our own ends or to make ourselves feel better about ourselves. Shame, defined in these terms, is not a good thing, not a helpful thing. And I know, I know that sometimes 
people try to make shame a good thing. They decry the lack of shame in some people, for example, as if it were a terrible thing. Oh, young people, they have no shame these days. People pretend that shame impels people to be better, though it rarely does. And I've also noticed that people are often happy to wish shame on others, but few are happy to wish it on themselves. But I think this story in Genesis makes it clear that shame was never, never intended to be a part of how we relate to each other or to God. And far from a lack of shame being the cause of disobedience or wrong action, we discover that it's the other way around and that shame comes from disobedience. Which takes us back, of course, to that opening scene where God is strolling around in the garden, enjoying the evening breezes and looking for some companionship. God wants to talk with the gardener, wants to shoot the breezes about the hostas and the begonias. But the gardener and his wife are no place to be found. They are hiding. They are hiding because they've discovered something. They have discovered shame. And shame is a new invention. And they don't even know what to call it. Did you notice that? When, when God calls them out, all the man can say is, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He was afraid because he was exposed, because he could not hell hide himself, and he was in fear of being judged for who he was. That particular fear is what we call shame, but the man and the woman didn't even have a word for that yet. And so the Lord God responds and says, who told you that you were naked? <coughs> now listen to that question, because it has a lot of meaning wrapped up in it. Who told you that you were naked? That means who told you that you were exposed. Even more importantly, it means who told you that you had anything to be ashamed of. But you see, here is the power of shame. Before, the man and the woman, they were naked. They were utterly exposed, not only in body, but also unafraid to show the world exactly who they were in every way. But when the Lord comes to the garden looking for the gardeners, nothing has changed about them. They are still the same people they were before. All that has changed is that shame has now come into the picture. And we will now, we we may well ask, well, where does that sense of shame come from? Is it there because they have been disobedient to what has been commanded of them? Well, possibly. But you know what? The story doesn't say that. I think it's more likely that the shame has been introduced because new knowledge has come to them, specifically the knowledge of good and evil, because, of course, that is what the fruit of the tree represents. Now, knowledge, and especially knowledge that allows people to discern between good and evil, is a good thing. According to Jewish tradition, this was the kind of knowledge that made a person an adult, someone who was responsible for the consequences of their own decisions. But it is also a kind of knowledge that unlocks a certain dark potential. It unlocks the temptation to make other people look bad so that we look good in comparison. 
And it is out of that tendency, I believe, that shame is born. And we see it right there in the story we read this morning. When the man and the woman are confronted with their failure to live up to the commandment they've been given, their instinct, their immediate instinct, is to try and blame and shame others. And so the man says, the woman, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree and I ate. And the woman said, the serpent tricked me and I ate. You see, the point of knowledge that allows you to discern between good and evil is that you should take responsibility for that discernment and for the decisions you make. But that is exactly what they fail to do. And failing to take responsibility, they seek instead to transfer it to others. And they begin that process of tearing down others to build themselves up. And it is from that process that shame gets its power. You know, I was always told, I was always taught that this story of the garden in the book of Genesis is a story of how sin entered into the world. Indeed, the Bible we read from this morning still tells me that. The translators of this story in the New Revised Standard Version have given this story a title, The First Sin and Its Punishment. So I'm told by the editors, by the translators, that that's what this story is about. But there's just one problem with that. The word sin is not mentioned, not even once in this whole story. Nowhere in chapters 2 or 3 of Genesis is the word sin. Nowhere. The concept of sin is actually only introduced later in the Bible, in the story, Genesis chapter 4, the story of Cain and Abel. So actually, this, this whole idea that this story is all about sin is actually something that later theologians came up with. So let me ask you the question, well, what if this story is not about sin? What if it is rather about a much more insidious problem, the problem of shame? Because you know what? This story makes it quite clear that it was never God's intention that we should be controlled by shame. And it also suggests that the, it was the alienation caused by the shame that made it impossible for the man and the woman to enjoy the peace and the fellowship of the time of the evening breezes with, in the garden with the Creator. Sin will come, yes. But in this story, I think shame is the enemy. And shame is still the enemy. For many people, shame is what prevents them from expressing who they are, who they were made to be. It is what makes people feel bad about things that ultimately do not matter. And shame is certainly still a tool that is used to keep people down and prevent them from standing up for what matters to them. Shame is not needed, not a good thing. We are beings, the Bible tells us, who are created to be unashamed when naked, not just physically but in every way. So I leave you today with a question. Who told you that you were naked? Who told you that you needed to be ashamed? Maybe they were wrong. Maybe they didn't have your best interest at heart. And maybe, maybe, we all ought to think before telling others that they should be ashamed too.
O Lord our God, shame causes so much damage in our personal lives and our relationships. Set us free. Set us truly free from its power. Amen.